called me Peter, the rock. For me, he said, he would build his church. Some rock I am. I spent three years as his disciple, and now look at me, tempted to run back to a fishing pole instead. I swore I would lay down my life for him. Now that he's gone, how am I supposed to know what to do? How do I build his church? Where do I start? When do I start? Jesus, my rabbi, resurrected, the Messiah, the one we have waited for, the one who offers new life in God. I have faith in him, but should he have faith in me? It was the season of Pentecost, a time in the Jewish tradition to give thanks for the harvest. The followers of Jesus quietly gathered in the upper room where Jesus had shared the bread and the wine with them. The room felt empty without his presence. Peter, give us a blessing for our Pentecost meal. Our Heavenly Father, we give thanks for your bountiful harvest. We remember our beloved Rabbi, Jesus, who was crucified and died and rose from the grave to show us that your love is mightier than death itself. God, what on earth are we to do now? Uh, amen. They shared their meal silently, unsure of their future. And then, all of a sudden, a sound like a roaring wind filled the whole house. Wondrous tongues of light like fire danced above their heads and came to rest upon them. And, filled with the Spirit of God, they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Indeed, God's Holy Spirit had descended upon them. It was then that Peter recalled Jesus' words of promise I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Jesus had not abandoned them. They were not alone. Indeed, they were filled with the Spirit of God. Hallelujah! Eagerly, they left the upper room to tell everyone the good news. A pilgrim named Stephen, walking along with his friends, saw the commotion and ventured toward the joyful apostles. 
Excuse me, you there. I have traveled many, many miles to reach Jerusalem for Pentecost. Yet you speak my language fluently. How is this so? But another pilgrim scoffed. Come on, they're all just drunk. Listen, don't you see? It's just as the prophet Joel said. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all people. So now, let all Israel hear this. Now seated at the right hand of God, Jesus has poured out the promised Holy Spirit. This is what you now see in us and hear. The Jewish pilgrims were cut to the heart and cried out, What shall we do? Repent. Be baptized in the name of Jesus the Christ. Your sins are forgiven, and you will receive new life in God. Many who heard these words believed, and indeed about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And the Holy Spirit was just getting started. One day, at the hour of prayer, Peter and John walked to the temple. Now a man who was lame from birth sat begging by the gate. The man asked Peter for money, and Peter responded, Silver, gold, I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, walk! Instantly, the man's legs became strong. And he jumped up, running into the temple, praising God. All the Jews who saw this were amazed. Inside the temple, the priests of the high council were stunned by the beggar's healing. They questioned Peter. By what power did you do this? And Peter, filled with the God's spirit, said boldly, We have nothing to hide by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the one you crucified and was raised from the dead. This lame man now stands before you, healthy and whole. Shaken, the priests commanded Peter and John to no longer speak of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, We can't keep quiet about this. This is the good news. New life in Jesus, the Christ. This, of course, was blasphemy. They had Peter and John thrown into jail. An angel of God opened the jailhouse door and led them out. At daybreak, the jailer discovered them gone. The religious leaders found Peter and John once again at the temple, preaching and healing. The priests realized they must find a way to stop them. One of these new believers, Stephen, worked tirelessly to help the poor and hungry. He was so full of God's grace, he caught the attention of the religious leaders. Stephen was dragged before the high council. Charged with blasphemy, Stephen spoke eloquently, recalling the ancient stories of Abraham, Moses, and David, and reminding the high council of the times throughout history, the Jewish people had rejected prophets whom God sent. Jesus is the risen Messiah, proclaimed Stephen, here in spirit to bring us God's kingdom, here and now on earth. This is the good news of God's love. You who try to stop these words of truth about Jesus, you are forever opposing God's spirit, just as your ancestors did. The priests of the high council were furious. One of them, a brilliant young scholar named Paul of Tarsus, was enraged. How dare Stephen accuse them of opposing God? 
Paul summoned a mob which seized Stephen and dragged him out. As Stephen faltered, he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. On that terrible day, a severe persecution began against the believers in Jerusalem. Going from house to house, Paul of the High Council found them, men and women alike, and dragged them off to prison. Fearful, many believers fled the city, and still Paul was consumed with a desire to destroy the young church at any cost. He proposed to the High Council that he travel to the synagogues in nearby Damascus. If any believers of Christ were hiding there, he might arrest them and drag them back to Jerusalem as well. And so he set off to the north, chasing after the refugees, his heart full of rage and violence. But what, or who, was that blocking the road? Hey, you! Get out of my way! Paul! Paul! Why do you persecute me? Who are you? You don't recognize me. Your anger and your condemnation blind you. I am Jesus, the Son of God. I am love incarnate. Oh, oh dear Lord, no. Listen to me, Paul. You do not have to live in anger and fear. Your cruelty and violence carried out in my father's name, they break my heart, Paul. Jesus, where are you? My eyes and my heart are open now. I, I, I see the truth. What have I done? Oh, my dear God, forgive me. Forgive me. The believers were not aware of God's visit upon Paul on the Damascus Road. Afraid of persecution, many continued to flee Jerusalem. As they did, they carried the good news with them to synagogues in far cities. In Jerusalem, Peter, John, and the others continued to meet, quietly but faithfully. One day, they received a letter from a friend, Philip, who had fled to Samaria, a town nearly 100 miles away. To my friends in Christ in Jerusalem, Greetings I send you. I have found safety in Samaria, living in quiet faith with fellow believers. We wish to establish a church here, and have many questions before embarking on this endeavor. I write to you, seeking your guidance and wisdom. Kindest regards, your friend, Philip. Those brave people. Then Peter spoke with dawning clarity and conviction. They need us. They need encouragement. They need guidance, and they're just as frightened as we are. 
Could they risk writing back to Philip, let alone travel boldly to Samaria, who next might be a victim like Stephen, crushed by the High Council's merciless oppression? You understand what this means, don't you? The good news of Jesus is not just for the Jews here in Jerusalem. The good news is for Jews everywhere. We need to share the news of Jesus across the land, the whole world. But there are only a few of us. How could we ever reach so many synagogues when we risk our lives stepping outside our dooryard? How? With that crazy, beautiful wind of Pentecost, that Spirit of God. He's right. God's Spirit will provide us everything we need. Eagerly, John jumped up to prepare them for the journey. Let's go, Peter. Let's go to Samaria, and then let's... Well, just, we'll just keep going. But wait. A sudden knock at the door. It was Paul. The very man who had been instrumental in Stephen's death. Eager to tell them about his experience on the road to Damascus, Paul had sought out the believers in Jerusalem. But when Peter and the others saw him at their door, well, they were afraid. Paul fervently recounted the details of his face-to-face -face encounter with the risen Christ. Yet Peter and John remained suspicious. They knew that Paul, just a short time ago, would have stopped at nothing, including trickery, to harm believers. Only kind old Barnabas truly welcomed him, convinced of Paul's earnest conversion. What was to be done? After much consultation, it became clear that Paul, in his unbridled passion, would further anger the priests of the High Council. It was decided that Peter and John would still embark on their journey to Samaria. Barnabas, meanwhile, convinced Paul to travel north to the city of Antioch, where he would be safe. What is this? It's all, well, it's branding, a symbol of what we're up to. The Greek word for fish is ichthys, so it's an acrostic for the Greek words, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. It'll be our secret symbol to communicate with believers safely. The Romans and the Temple High Council won't guess what it's about, but believers will know. And then it was time for Paul to depart. Paul, oh, I give you this typewriter. Write me a letter when you settled in Antioch. In a few months, I'll come visit you. Thus, for many days and many miles, Peter and John set off for far-flung synagogues, sharing the good news of Jesus, the promised Messiah who offers new life in God. They met people who needed healing, who needed encouragement, and who needed the good news of Jesus. Then, one day, they received word that a kind, generous woman named Tabitha was very ill in a nearby town. Tabitha's friends pleaded with them to come help her. Upon their arrival, Peter learned he was too late. Tabitha had died. He prayed, then said boldly, Tabitha, get up! At once, she opened her eyes and sat up. Upon seeing her alive, her friends were overjoyed.
Later, in a moment of reflection, John wondered and mused, That's healing of Tabitha. I mean, man, I think she was dead. This is freaking amazing. Yes, but really, how much can we do? For every person we heal, there's so many, many more we don't reach. Huh. How on earth can we possibly do all this? Feel that wind, Peter? That's how. Once again, the spirit was showing them the way. While Peter sat in the warm car, he became sleepy and soon slipped into a dream. There was something above him, something falling, a white sheet. What did it say? Well, it was a restaurant menu filled with foods that were abhorrent to Peter. They were not kosher. An angel in white beckoned. No, no, I must not. This food is not kosher. And then Jesus, standing by the table. What God has made clean, you must not call profane. How could Peter possibly sit to such a meal? Then Jesus reached out his hand, reassuring him. John, John, I've had a vision. I know now. God shows no partiality, none at all. Everyone who acts justly is acceptable to God. Those who follow the law of Moses, those who don't, the good news is for everyone, every single person. Everyone, even people, Gentiles, who blatantly disregard the law of Moses, everyone. Well then, I, I should have bought more gas, I guess. Peter and John's travels eventually led them back to Jerusalem. It was there that they encountered new dangers. Shocking news! The Roman governor was rounding up believers, even executing them. And there were Roman guards standing a few yards away. Hey, you there! Stop! Seized. John cowered in a shed, terrified. Peter was thrown into prison. As night fell, 
the prison became as dark as a tomb. Alone in his cell, Peter's thoughts turned to other times he had attempted to evade Roman soldiers. Peter whispered aloud, Jesus, forgive me. Once again, I've failed you. But then, a light, an angel. Was he dreaming? And then, Peter found himself on the street near the upper room. Bruised and hurting, he struggled to the door. It was locked. It's me, it's me. Please, let me in. Peter, it's you. Even as Peter and John carried the good news to cities and towns along the Mediterranean coast, Paul and Barnabas were establishing a church in Antioch, a large bustling city 300 miles north of Jerusalem. Paul, my friend, do you ever stop working? Is our work for God ever done? Our church here in Antioch is doing well. We have a strong congregation now. And it's not just Jews among us. We have welcomed non-Jews, Gentiles, into our church as well. Yes, we certainly have, and they join us because we accept them as they are. We don't insist that they follow all Jewish traditions, like eating only kosher foods or refraining from work on the Sabbath. The growth of our church is a miracle, and only God knows what will happen next. This is what will happen next. We will travel here, and here, and here, to tell everyone about Jesus and the life-changing love he offers. We shall establish new churches across this entire region. Well then, let's get going. My friends, I am Paul. This yeah. is my traveling companion, Barnabas. Uh, yes, sir. That's we right. We have traveled here to tell you the good news about the Rabbi Jesus. Amen. Whom God has revealed to me as the long-awaited Messiah, the Christ. Amen, indeed. Uh, yes, sir. That's right. He was arrested uh -huh. and crucified yeah. by the Romans. Right. And yet he uh -huh. rose from the grave on third day. Amen, indeed. Jesus fulfills the yeah. law. Ooh, yeah. Follow Jesus and you will have new life in God. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. That's right. The worshippers were amazed at his teaching. Some were moved to tears by Paul's masterful words and were eager to learn more. But others were offended. Who were these men who challenged tradition so boldly? As Paul and Barnabas continued to teach, their anger grew. Stop this nonsense! We'll make you stop! Go on, get out of here! Whoa, uh, Paul, uh, they're getting a bit uppity. This is not productive. Uh, you're telling me, uh, let's get out of here! And thus it continued with Paul and Barnabas traveling from town to town, preaching and teaching as they went. 
In the town of Lystra, there was a woman who could not use her feet. She had been crippled since birth. She listened to Paul's teaching intently, and Paul, seeing her faith, said to her loudly, Stand upright on your feet. She was healed. These men must be gods in human form. Although Paul and Barnabas protested, she began to worship them. These are the gods Zeus and Hermes. Complicating things enormously, her friend presented Paul and Barnabas with garlands and an oxen to sacrifice in their honor. Stop, we're just ordinary men. We bring you the good news and power of the living God. Amid the chaos, others arrived and saw what was happening. These men aren't gods, they're blasphemers. Pick up a stone, stop this profanity immediately. The crowd turned on Paul and Barnabas. and beaten, the next day Paul and Barnabas left. They would head back to Antioch where they could heal their wounds and rest. Limping and wounded, Peter and Barnabas returned to Antioch to the relative safety of their first church. Had they accomplished what they'd set out to do? Perhaps they had, Paul reflected. Only time would tell. As they stepped into the Antioch church, what a surprise! There before them stood Peter and James, the brother of Jesus, and others. Seeing their wounds, Peter greeted them with concern and called for refreshments to be brought. Gratefully, Paul and Barnabas accepted. Over cups of steaming tea, the apostles talked all night long, sharing their joys, their trials, and their hopes for the future. At dawn, a member of the Antioch church brought them a plentiful breakfast, overflowing platters of muffins, pots of coffee, plates of eggs and bacon, pancakes and sausage. They were all ravenous and turned with delight to the bounty. Then James abruptly flinched and drew back. Forgive me, but I cannot eat this. It is not kosher. Kosher? That is certainly not kosher. Our Antioch cook is a Gentile. I have been following the laws of Moses my entire life. I'm not going to stop now for the sake of one corrupted pancake. Many in this Antioch congregation are Gentiles. They are believers in Christ. They were never Jews to begin with. Why should they follow Jewish dietary laws? I cannot eat this rubbish. I am a Christian. I am also a Jew. I shall eat my food my kosher food, over here instead. That's ridiculous, and I must say, more than a little insulting to my Gentile friends. My careful and complete observance of these dietary rules are a testament to my devotion to God. My friends, Paul, James, let's not argue here. We're Jews. There's no reason why those who choose to remain kosher cannot do so. You have completely missed the point. No. You've missed the point. But Jesus was a Jew. We were born as Jews. To be an acceptable Christian, one must first journey through the rites of Judaism in order to properly become a Christian. You're saying my Gentile friends, indeed all Gentiles who want to follow Christ, 
must first convert to Judaism in order to be baptized into Christianity? That's madness. It's not madness. It's the proper order of things. Do you think Jews have a monopoly on the desire to commune with God? Surely, Peter, you don't agree with James. And what about you, Barnabas? Peter was torn. He did not want to openly oppose James, who had, it seemed, a reasonable point. I don't know. If James doesn't want to eat this food that the Gentiles have provided, that's his prerogative, I guess. You hypocrite! You've said yourself that God had revealed to you all things are now acceptable in his eyes. That obviously includes Gentiles. How dare you say one thing and then another? Peter stood still, helplessly caught between James and Paul. He recalled the vision he had experienced ten years ago of Jesus inviting him to the table where what God has made clean you must not call profane. And guilt bubbled up in his heart. When Jesus walked among men, what did he do? He repeatedly broke the Sabbath, comforting and healing and serving the poorest among us. He demonstrated those laws are no longer significant. He gave us two new commandments, to love one another and to love God. That's it. Peter did not need Paul to lecture him about Jesus. Don't you tell me what Jesus did. I'm the one who walked alongside him, not you. For three years, I was his disciple. And you know what? He called me the rock on which he would build his church. You, a rock. Ha, how can you be a rock when you're so squishy you don't even know if a Christian must keep kosher or not? Peter was speechless at the insult. It's too bad we can't ask Stephen for his opinion on the matter. These caustic words ripped apart Paul's heart. This is ridiculous. I want nothing more to do with any of you hypocrites. Apparently, I alone understand God's plan. And now, I have God's work to do. Go ahead, hang out with those filthy Gentiles. Write them your long-winded, self-important letters. Like that'll do any good. And thus, Paul set out on a missionary journey of nearly 800 miles. He established churches along the way and wrote letters to many other churches along the way, guiding and encouraging them. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. One day, in exhaustion, Paul fell asleep at a restaurant table. He had a dream. Paul, Paul, here is where you must go. Macedonia, this is where you are needed. 
Paul awoke with a start. He would go now to Macedonia. Seeking a place sheltered from the wind for prayer and solitude, Paul headed toward a riverbank. As he walked, he neared a cluster of people, a fortune teller, her master, and a customer who was giving the master some money. As he passed, the fortune teller looked at him and cried out, That man there, he is sent by God to tell us how to receive God's grace. That's the man of God, the man of God, right there. There he is, everybody. That's the man of God. She kept on shouting unceasingly, annoyingly, until Paul, tired and irritable, could not stand her shouting any longer. In the name of Christ, I command you to stop. Indeed, she did stop. Paul's words caused an immediate transformation in her. Touched by God's spirit, she was changed liberated, joyful. She refused to tell more fortunes. Her master was incensed. Her fortune telling was my income. How dare you interfere with my business? The master seized Paul and dragged him before a police officer. This foreigner is causing trouble with our Roman customs. They must be stopped. The police officer dragged Paul off to prison. The apostles gathered somberly to discuss the divisive words at Antioch. Whom do you follow, Barnabas? Peter and James, or Paul? I follow Jesus. That's not what she's asking. Do you agree that Gentiles must obey the law of Moses to be true Christians? I doubt this will be the last disagreement among the followers of Christ. We must find a path to peace here, a compromise that honors all. Peter had been wrestling with Paul's sharp words, and as much as they stung, he recognized the truth in them. Peter reminded the group of the vision he had experienced some ten years earlier, when Jesus had beckoned him to a table filled with non-kosher foods. He concluded, God who knows the heart has showed that he accepted the Gentiles. Well then, let's keep our requirements simple. Abstain from food sacrificed to pagan idols, from the meat of strangled animals, and from physical immorality. That should not be too onerous for the Gentiles to follow, and that should satisfy Paul as well. Maybe so, but what if Paul is preaching things God doesn't approve of? How can we be sure Paul knows what God wants? Mary, perhaps the church that does not struggle with and work toward its understanding of God is not trying hard enough to find God. But Paul was so incredibly rude to Peter and to James, too. I do not respect Paul. He's arrogant. He's hot-headed. There is nothing Christ-like about him. Mary, let me put it a different way. Together, we are the body of Christ. Just as a body has many parts, hands and feet, mouth and eyes, head and heart, so it is with Christ. We were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, made up of not one part, but of many parts. Barnabas, you are wise. <laughs> Those are not my words. Those are Paul's. Meanwhile, back in Macedonia, Paul was led into a dark, creepy prison.
Amid the filth and darkness, Paul began to sing ever so softly. Secure from all alarm, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arm. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arm. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning. Earthquake! At once, the chains dropped from their limbs. What joy! They jumped up, singing and praising God. Who was this man whom God had set free? Let me tell you about the joy we have all found in Christ, the Messiah. And thus the jailer became a believer, and Paul was set free. So I say to you, walk in the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Since we live in the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. A letter from Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, to all in Rome who are called to be his holy people. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. A letter from Paul, an apostle, to the churches in Galatia. In Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed themselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, 
writing to the church of God that is in Corinth. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, that all of you be in agreement, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be knit together in the same mind and the same purpose. If I speak in the tongues of humans and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers, understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Peter, what is it? Well, the good news of Jesus is very slowly spreading. I hear Paul has reached Athens. There are young churches, little tender seeds, springing up through the soil and Corinth, in Ephesus, in Philippi, and of course Antioch. That is good news. Well, yes, but they're growing in gardens controlled by the Roman Empire. Indeed, the good news is at the threshold of Rome itself. I don't understand. We say there's one true God. Jews understand that. Romans do not. And? Rome will see the good news as a direct challenge to their pagan beliefs, and more specifically to their belief that their emperor is a god. When that happens, the Romans will crush us. Well, what can we do? Well, I know what I must do. I must go to Rome. Oh, no! Years passed. Paul traveled and preached, prayed and wrote letters, and then he sensed a new call. It was time to return to Jerusalem. There he knew he would face adversaries on many sides. When he stepped into the temple at Jerusalem, where he had once served with such authority on the high council, he was named a heretic by his former friends and associates. He was arrested. For a long time he languished under house arrest, considered a rabble-rouser, a troublemaker by the Roman authorities there. Finally, he appealed to Rome, requesting a fair trial. And so Paul was sent under guard to Rome. The journey was difficult and dangerous. In Rome, he was again kept under house arrest, but he could write there, and he did. Before he departed from Jerusalem, Peter returned at dawn 
to the Garden of Gethsemane. He was clear-headed now. He saw the road before him, and he saw its end. It would be an honor and a joy to carry Jesus' message of love and forgiveness to the heart of the world, to Rome. My brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. While Paul languished under house arrest, a great fire ignited among the merchant shops in the crowded streets of Rome. For nine days the fire raged. Two-thirds of the city was reduced to ash. But, it was rumored, the fire was no accident. The Emperor Nero had deliberately set the city aflame to clear the way for majestic new villas and gardens. The anguished citizens demanded a scapegoat for the devastation. Nero pointed. Christians. And so, by Emperor Nero's orders, Christians were indiscriminately arrested, imprisoned. Paul was among them. Peter, is that you? Welcome, Paul. I didn't know you were in Rome. It's quite the tourist trap, actually. I've heard many great things about you, Peter, about the churches you have nurtured among the Jewish people. You have done God's work well, and you have carried God's good news to many Gentiles. You have traveled far, and your letters have traveled further. Your letters, Paul. Our holy scripture. Peter, you are the cornerstone of the Church of Christ. Someday, someone will build a magnificent church, an immense church, the most beautiful church in the world, right here, right in Rome, and it will bear your name, and generation after generation will worship within its walls. And someday, Paul, your letters will be published. They'll be cherished and shared It'll be inspiration for generation after generation. Heck, I bet someday your letters will be bound together with the Torah. It'll be a New York Times bestseller. Peter, share this with me. When evening came, Jesus took the bread, and he gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of Christ broken for you. <laughs> 